past, our whole society, our whole world, again, is changing. Certainly everybody that happens to be, again, on planet Earth has been touched by the pandemic that we're going through. The, um, uh, this uh, this uh, virus it seems to have invaded, again, every corner that happens to be in the world, but, but also society. You know, it's, it seems to have put, put so much pressure on society that the fissures, again, that were all, all, always there have cracked wide open. And you can see the hatred, you can see the violence, you can see the disunity, disunity you can see the lack of peace all over our, our, our world today. You know, and I'm so thankful that we can go through this passage of Scripture because it really, again, allows us to see, again, what God is doing, to understand at times, and to really strengthen us. I'm afraid, again, when we come through this time, you know, and the church is allowed to gather, gather together, that there's going to be many seats that, uh, that are going to be missing. There's going to be many casualties uh, through this time, and there's going to be a number of people who will not be following the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and it hurts my heart to say that. Uh, but as more pressure comes on the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll see again a number of people who, uh, who will depart and have departed again already. At the same time, again, God in, in the midst of all that pressure, many times when he purifies the church, adds to the church. And I, and I really think that this will be a time where we see some people come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and it will cause us to rejoice. But in the midst of that, we have to understand as the people of God what God is doing. And I'll, I'll invite you to open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And last time we were together, we started going through verses 29 and 30. And 29 and 30, we said again, are really explaining verse number 28, aren't they? Because they begin again, with the first word that happens to be in verse number 29 is for. You know, it's giving an explanation how all things work together for good. For those, again, who happen to be the called of God. For those who are called according to the purposes of God. And we see it, right? That we are to be changed or we are to be molded. We're to be transformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what he means by that, again, is that, that we are to take on the likeness of Jesus Christ. In other words, his purposes are redemptive in nature. Many times when we look, again, at the purposes that we want of ourselves, we have a, a, a happiness paradigm, our happiness purposes. You know, we want this to take place, this to take place, this to take place. So we have this in the end. But Jesus Christ is so different. Again, he has a personal uh, holiness paradigm, our per personal holiness purposes for each one of our lives, that he might transform us and make us look more and more like him, like the Lord Jesus Christ. And we realize that in every one of our, li in, in every one of our lives who, been, who are Christians. What we were back here, back here, we are not now. We have been changed. We have been altered. We've been molded more and more like the image of Jesus Christ. But what we shall be, again, is not what we are now. That, that process will continue on in each one of our lives. And look at what he says at the end of verse number 29 in light, light of that. He says, in order that. And notice those purpose, that, that, that's a purpose statement, isn't it? In order that. In other words, he's telling us the purpose of why he wants to transform us, why he wants to change us in the image of Jesus Christ. And that is, he, in order that he might, be, speaking of Jesus Christ, be the firstborn among many brethren. So when you look at it, again, when he talks about, again, changing us, he's talking about all things work together for good, and that he's changing us to be more in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, so that, in the end, that Jesus Christ might be the firstborn among many brethren. What does it mean by firstborn? What does it mean that, that he is the firstborn among many brethren? And we would say something like this. We would say, well, he's the first in line. You know, of this whole uh, uh, kingdom, again, all of these kingdom citizens that are taken from every tribe, every nation, every race, every people group that happen to be again on the planet, that are brought together that will ultimately glorify God that happens to be above. You know, he's the first one of this many, many tribe, this many uh, people kingdom that will come. And if that's the way that we would explain it, it's partially right. You know, but it means so much more than that because firstborn means the one who has the preeminence. Back then, if you were the firstborn in the family, you, you were the preeminent child. You were the preeminent son. You were the one, again, who had all the accolades, all the privileges that happened to be again in you. And this is telling us the ultimate purpose, the ultimate purpose of our redemption, the ultimate purpose of Jesus Christ conforming us to be more in his image is that ultimately he might be prized. You know, that sin might be eradicated in our life and we might recognize the value, that we might re recognize the beauty, that we might recognize the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, 
all the redemptive purposes, again, of God are not, again, me-centered or you-centered. All the purposes, again, are Christ-centered, that he might have the preeminence, that he might have the glory. And you see this, again, uh, the meaning in uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 18, he says, in speaking of Christ, he says, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, and listen to what it says next, the firstborn from the dead, why? That he, in everything he might have what? Preeminence, right? It's all about Christ. It's all about praising him. It's all about worship. And we have to give one reason of all the purposes of God. One word, real, one word, it would be worship. That he is worthy of all worship. You know, we see that in a mighty passage over in Philippians chapter 2 that speaks of the humiliation of the Lord Jesus Christ, how he came in the form of a servant, how he took on human flesh, and how he became obedient even to the, even to the point of death. And then right after that, it tells us what God does again in uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verses 9 to 11. It says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him, on Christ, the name that is above every name, so that in the name of Jesus every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, here it is, to the glory of God the Father, right? Praising Jesus. And what, what does it do? It ultimately glorifies the Father that happens to be above. It's all about Christ. You know, and when we find the church all gathered together in heaven, we read in Revelation chapter 5, verses 12 and 13, this mighty anthem that comes forth. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And that's what a redemption is about. You know, we're given this glorified human existence. We're given, again, this whole total transformation that will come, that we might enjoy, that we might take great pleasure, that we might see the value and worth of the Lord Jesus Christ. In one word, it's about worship. You know, that's what it's about. You know, that's where God, again, is ultimately, again, taking us. But the question becomes, how does he get us there? How does he get us to that point where it's all about worship of the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, and that's what he's explaining in, in verses 29 and 30. He's explaining the highest purposes that God could ever have, again, for your life, again, in my life. And he uses five words, which are really five doctrines. You know, and they're almost like links on a chain. You know, they're, in, they're unbreakable. One link leads to another link, leads to another link, leads to another link. You know, and we began looking at them last day, and we saw that God has four chosen, or four ordained, or four knew us. You know, so here we have four known, and the next link that happens to be right there is that we are predestined, and the next link that happens to be there is that we're called, and the next link that happens to be there is that we're justified, and the next link, again, is that we are glorified. And it's amazing to see. Because the plans of God stretch for you and me, stretch from eternity past all the way to the eternal future. You know, that's what he's talking about again in these verses that happen to be again right here. And I love the language. Because if you look at the tense of all of these words that are used, they're all past tense. Even glorification. Even that we will be glorified one day. And why? Because it's all according to the plan of God. It's all again what God is doing for us. Bringing to that point, point, point there will be a mighty nation. A mighty kingdom that glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's said and again in the past tense because it's so certain, you know, that this will come to pass. You know, when we looked at the first two links in that chain last time we were to get, uh, together, we looked again at what it means to be foreknown. And we said again, when you look at the f word foreknow, it's not passive. You know, it's not just that God is doing nothing, again, and just wringing his hands and looking down the corridor of time and seeing who will trust him, seeing who will believe on him and who will not believe on him. No, it's active. It's the word, again, means for chosen or for loved. You know, he decided in eternity past, not based upon any merit in me, not based upon any merit in you, who would come to Christ and who would not. You know, who he would have a relationship, who he would set his love on, and those purposes are found in him of why he chose one and he did not cho uh, choose another. And we realize that. You know, so we recognize, you know, a lot of times we think of our salvation starting in time, and there's a sense where it does start in time. But it's pre-planned, pre-ordained by God in eternity past. You know, it's amazing because he has a plan for us, right? 
Because we realize that foreknow means again that we have been predestined. And we said the difference between foreknow and predestined is this, is that there is a destination. There, there is an end that happens to be again in mind. And that's what we were talking about just a second ago. Well, we are predestined, we are, we are pre predetermined end to look exactly like the Lord Jesus Christ in all manner that redeemed humanity can look like the Lord Jesus Christ, ultimately to the glory again of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, and we said again as we look at this, the reason why we need to look at this is because we can be so myopic as believers. We, and myopathy is just being nearsighted. In other words, again, I can just see the problems and the difficulties that happen to be ex in the, existing in the here and now. And I'm always asking why. Why am I going through the suffering? Why am I going through these disappointments? Why has my life again been shattered? Why am I going through these events? Why is my world going through these events? And what it's telling us is how God is taking us from way over here to way over here. He's showing us that, uh, that, uh, that awesome process that in the middle of the sufferings of life, in the middle of the disappointments of life, that we might have hope, that we might not be shaken as the people of God, and even as we look at our whole world that happens to be around us, that is being shaken at this time. God's purposes, again, are coming and pass. You know, and we can trust in him. So what, what we're trying to do as we look at these verses is really give us hope. Hope in the here and now. Strength as we walk in the here and now that God's purposes, again, are coming to pass. You know, and so what I want us to do again this morning is just look at the next three links that happen to be again in that chain. And as we look at these next three links, they've all been mentioned already in, uh, in, uh, verse, in uh, chapter number eight. Uh, but they're logical links that happen to be again right there. And the next link that we see again is right here in verse number 30, and that is again that we have been called of God. And look at what it says again right here. In fact, let's read verse 29 into 30. It says, For those who he foreknew, he also predestined, to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that we might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, what did he do? He also called. Now, we saw this calling already in verse number 28. You know that all things work together for good to those that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. You know, and we said again as we looked at that word, again, that calling is talking about a specific calling that happened to be in our life. And we said when you, when you look at the call of God, when you study that precept that happens to be again in the word of God, you have to come to a determination, you have to come to a conclusion that there's two definite calls that happen to be in the word of God. And the first one, again, is basically what theologians many times call the general call. And it's basically issuing a call to come to Christ, right? Come to him. You know, bow the knee. Recognize your sin. Recognize your need. Recognize what he has done. Trust the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, and there's a call to come. In fact, Jesus Christ even issues his call many times to those who happen to be around him. In Matthew chapter 11, verse number 23, he says, come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Right? It's a legitimate call. It's a legitimate offer. All those who come to Christ, all those who trust in him, he will truly again give the rest. You know, in John chapter 7, in verse number 37, he says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. You know, if you're thirsty, if you're parched, if you recognize your sin, if you recognize there's no life in you, Come to Christ, and he will give you that living water, you know, that will bubble over to eternal life. You know, and, and it's a legitimate offer. Whoever comes will be saved for all of eternity. But here's the question. Who comes? Who will ultimately come? And the, and the answer to that is because of the hardness, again, of our human, human heart. If God doesn't move, nobody will ever come. You know, we find that so to... Clearly taught in the Word of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 14. He says the natural person. Now the natural person is just the unsaved individual. You know, the individual, again, who's in their natural state, in their sinful state, outside of Jesus Christ. And he says this, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. Why? For they are foolishness for him. And he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And the idea, again, of spiritually discerned is, is uh, basically this. You know, they can never come to a right de determination. They never will come to a right determination with the gospel. You could preach and preach and preach. You could testify and testify and testify. You could give the most powerful sermons. You could be a Spurgeon. You could be a Paul and preach. And nobody comes unless God moves. You know, and the question we have to ask ourselves is why are we here this morning? 
Why have we placed our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? When Christ said, come to me, why did we respond to that gospel message? Well, listen to what 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 22 and 24, because it's explaining it. It says, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach, what do we preach? We preach Christ crucified. Well, what is that to other people? Well, Paul explains, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to Gentiles. But, here it is, here it is, there's another category. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. But to those who are called, the called. Who is Jesus Christ? He's the power. He's the wisdom. Right? To the Jews. Well, he's cursed. You know, he, he's a forgery. Why? Because he's hanging on a tree. Cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. You know, he's, he's a forgery. We know he's false. Look, he's been cursed by God. You know, there's no way that anybody could ever put their faith and trust in that. And to the Romans, you're telling me that the great God, again, of all eternity, the creator God of all of eternity, came in human flesh? Why would he ever die in human flesh? And then he died a death on a cruel Roman cross? That's absolutely folly. That's foolishness. Only a simpleton would believe that message. You know, but for us, who are the called... We see the wisdom. We see the power of God. We see that there is no other way for me as a sinner to be made right in God's sight. Well, what's the difference between this group and this group? And it says, the called of God. Those who have this effective call in their life that always brings them to salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, here's the question I want us to ask. Again, how do we know when we look at this passage of scripture that Paul is talking about effective calling or effectual calling to Christ. You know, and there's, a good, and there's a good reason why we know. In fact, there's two reasons. And the first one, again, happens to begin verse number 28, which goes into verse number 29 because it talks about the called and talks about, again, those who are called according to the purposes of God, right? And what he's talking about in verse number 28 is that God's purposes for our calling, our redemptive, right? And we wouldn't say that for the loss. We wouldn't say God has called them again for redemptive purposes because they're, they're not being redeemed. They have not been changed. They have not been altered into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we know that this is talking about, again, a specific call, you know, redemptive in nature that brings people to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But also, verse number 29, look at how it says. It's... Uh, Verse number 30, look at what it says. And those whom he predestined, he called. So think about it. All those who are forechosen are predestined to this destination, to this determination of what they will become like. And all the predestined are called. Well, we wouldn't say that. We, we, we wouldn't say that about the general call. We wouldn't say, again, if we have a whole bunch of unsaved individuals, that they're all, again... Uh, predestined to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only a specific group that is predestined to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, and those are believers. So what this is talking about, again, is the work of God that happens to be in our hearts, to bring us to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? He's showing us, again, we are foreknew, forechosen, we were predestined to be in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore, in time, what does God do? He calls us. He brings us to himself. He causes us to bow the knee, to recognize the need to have to be in our life and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all his work. You know, and it shows again his work. It shows again his process. It shows that his salvation is coming to pass in the people of God. Now, let me take a little detour, just for a second. Because I want to ask a question that's many times asked of this text, and especially when we get into chapter number 29. It's many times asked, and, and it's basically this. How do I know that I am the called of God? How do I know, even if we go back to foreknowledge, how, how do I know that I've been foreknown, forechosen, foreselected, elect of God from eternity past? And I think that's a great question. I think it's a great question, and also, at the same time, here it is, the wrong question, right? The, the, the idea, again, of foreknown, the idea, again, of calling is given to the people of God to show them the absolute security of the plan of God. You know, we, remember why this is written. This is written during suffering. 
This is where we're written that if we just looked at the things that happen to be around us, we would wonder if God is really for us. And he's telling us this plan of God is coming to pass. We've been left. You know, we will one day be glorified. His plan is coming to pass, and we can trust in him. The, the, these truths are given to believers. The right question to ask is not whether, again, I've been chosen before the foundation of the world or I, if I'm the elect of God or the called of God. The right question to ask is, have, am I trusting Jesus Christ? Is my faith in Jesus Christ? Have I bowed the knee, recognizing my knee so much so that I trust in Jesus Christ? You see, faith, we, we, we are called to have faith, not in ourselves, not in our good works, but in Jesus Christ. And when you look into the word of God, those, again, who happen to be believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, always have faith in Jesus Christ, always have faith in the promises of God. And you can see that being lived out. You can see that, again, being lived out in the true people of God, that they're truly believing in Christ. Now, let me ask you this morning, are you believing in Christ? Have you trusted him? Are you following him? Do you have faith in him? Because that, that describes the people of God, right? We, we even realize it again about Abraham. Abraham is given a promise of great posterity. He's given a promise again of a land. Well, how do we know Abraham has faith in God? We have, he has faith in God because he acted. He acted on that faith. You know, we read in Hebrews chapter 11, and verse number 8, by faith Abraham obeyed God when he was called to go out of a place that he was to receive an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. How do we know Abraham believed? How do we know Abraham was a called of God? We know Abraham was a called of God because he had faith in Christ. He had faith in God. We could say the same thing with Moses. How do we know Moses was the called of God? We know Moses was the called of God because he had faith in God, in the promises of God. Hebrews 11, chapter 24, uh, Hebrews 11, verses 24 to 26 says, By faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking for his reward. Right? How do we know he's called? We know he's the called because he has a faith in God, faith in the promises of God, faith in what God has spoken and what God has said. The better question to be asking is, do we have faith in Christ? Do we trust him? You know, is it living and active that happened again in our life? But what, what Paul is doing is putting all these chains together, showing us the good purposes again of God. And we, and, we, and we saw three of them. But the fourth one happens to be, again, justification. Look at verse number 29 again. Or, or verse number 30, I'm sorry. And he says, and those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also just, justified. And notice the he there. The he, that pronoun, is all talking about God. So just as God has, again, foreknown us, just as he's predestined us, just as he calls us to himself in time, he also justifies us. This is his work. You know, and we've gone through justification. I don't know <laughs> how many months, and we could say again every, um, a couple years as we've been going through this book. In fact, that's the main theme of the first eight chapter is justification by faith in Jesus Christ alone. You know, and the thing that really saddens me is that the vast majority of those who would call themselves or identify themselves as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, otherwise they would take that name Christian, still have no idea what justification is. You know, when they're asked again about the doctrine of justification, what it means to be justified in the sight of God, they'll many times talk about it as a process. Otherwise, God has to do his part and we have to do our part. And they don't understand that, that justification is a legal standing. It's a legal declaration in the sight of God of what God again has done. And that is again, he declares us not guilty and totally righteous in Jesus Christ. But it's what God again does. It's his declaration. It's a standing that does not fluctuate based upon my performance or the lack of performance that happens to be in my life. And we've seen this again throughout this chapter. In chapter number 3, verses 23 and 24, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's our problem. And then it says, And are justified. How? By his grace as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It's through Jesus Christ as a gift. He lived that perfect life and died that substitutionary death. And now all my sin 
is laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he dies on that cross, when he utters those words, it is finished. Everything that needed to be done was done. And his perfect righteousness is put on my account. So in the legal courtroom of God, I am absolutely not guilty and totally righteous in Jesus Christ. That's what the word of God teaches. And what's the outcome of that? Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, since we have been already done, already done, already done, already done, this is the outcome. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, not in myself, not in my own merit, but through Jesus Christ, where there used to be hostility, where there used to be a war going on, what is there now? There is peace with God. God, just exactly, again, what we need. And we, and we saw that at the beginning of this chapter, in Romans chapter 8, in verse number 1. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For all who are in Christ Jesus, all who have their life in the Lord Jesus Christ, all who are identified as being in Jesus Christ, there is no, no, no condemnation. There is no judgment. You know, and that's the doctrine, again, of justification by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. And we, and we say that so often, right? We are justified by faith in who? In Jesus Christ. And this is the key word. The next word is the key word. Alone. In other words, there's nothing else. There's no merit. There's no work. There's no penance. There's nothing that needs to be done. Jesus Christ has finished the deal. You know, everything that needed to be done is done in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the importance, again, of this doctrine cannot be over, uh, overstated because it's through our justification, right? We stand justified. We stand righteous in Jesus Christ that all the blessings of God in this life and the next life, again, flow through. You know, Anthony Hockema, again, explains this, again, so wonderfully. He says, he says the, the promises that go along with it, uh, with it will come to fruition, he says, the right, the right to eternal life, therefore, which has been merited for us by Christ and bestowed on us in our justification, like the blessing of being adopted by the children of God, points both to the present and to the future. Qualitatively, we possess eternal life here and now. And he's talking about our ju justification. We have eternal life right now. We are absolutely justified in Jesus Christ right now. But he goes on. As we know God in marvelous grace and experience rich fellowship with him in trust and in service, in prayer and praise. But we possess it now only as the first fruits of a greater harvest to come. After the resurrection of the body, we shall enjoy eternal life in all of its fullness. Then faith will be changed to sight, death and sorrow will be forgotten, and we will have reached the state of perfect knowledge of God, perfect enjoyment of God, perfect service of God, and that state, praise God, will never end. And it's all tied to our justification. It's all tied to the substitutionary nature of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that Christ paid for our sins in full. It's all done, and we stand, again, forevermore justified in him. So think of it, again, it's a marvelous plan, isn't it? It begins in eternity past, and in time when we trust the Lord Jesus Christ, when we're called and we place our faith in that instant, again, we're justified. And it guarantees all of the promises, again, of God. And now we come to the last link, again, in that chain, again, of salvation. And that is, again, our glorification. So let's read verse number 29 again. For those whom he foreknew, knew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those who he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And remember where he's taking us. He's taking us, again, how, and he's explaining how all things, because this is the question, right? How does this work? How, how, how does this work? All things work together. How does this work to, him, to, to my good and God's glory? And he's explaining it again all the way through it. And he's explaining, here it is in one word, the absolute, here's the word, sovereignty of who? Of God in all of this. And it's amazing because there happen to be again so many out there when it comes to verses 29 and 30 will, that will try to somehow subvert the, the uh, sovereignty of God. You know, they'll somehow try to say that we have, again, some choice in the whole matter. You know, that God's, again, perfect will, that he doesn't have a perfect will there. It's still up to us to decide. 
You know, and, and it's amazing to look at this because at the same time, they want to say beyond a shadow of doubt, but we have eternal security. Let me say as clearly as possible, if God is not sovereign over the whole process, there's no such thing as eternal security. You, you know, the Armenians got, got it right. They, they, they said that we have a part to play in our salvation. We have the freedom of choice, and anyone can choose him, whether they happen to be, again, God's elect. There's, in fact, there's no such thing as God's elect. You know, God chose whom he saw would choose him. You know, and they, and, they, and they got it right. They say it again, if it's up to ours, if it's our determination and not God's determination that happens to be, again, the key to all of this, then there's no eternal security. Because as easily as I can put myself in Christ, I can take myself outside of Christ. And they, and, and they got the logical deduction. If this is true, then this has to be true. That happens to be, again, over here. But the reason why, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can have absolute security, no matter what we go through, the reason why we can have that is because God is sovereign through the whole process. Right? And, and that's, that's Paul's whole point. You know, in the midst of agony, in the midst of suffering that happened to begin in our life, you know, when things seem to point to an opposite, opposite direction, God's in control. God's plan is working out. He, he had his plan foreordained in eternity past. He forechose us. You know, he predestined us to be conformed in, in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. He called us in time. And when he called us in time, he justified us. And he ultimately, because he justified us, you know, he will glorify us. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. What does it mean, though, that God will glorify us? You know, and I want us to go all the way back in this chapter to verse number 17. It's incredible because when you look at verses 17 and 18, you know, that whole, cha that whole um, a paragraph that really begins in verse number 18 is really explaining verses 17 and 18. You know, and look at what he says in verse number 17. He says, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ. And then he says this, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. It's incredible, isn't it? Because we said again way back months ago when we looked at that, looked at that verse, in order to, again to have that glorification, in order to get to, to, to that perfect state with the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to go through the suffering. Otherwise, again, suffering is part of the process, isn't it? Yes, we're saved. Yes, we are justified forevermore in Jesus Christ. But God has a, has a process to bring us over here. And through all the suffering, that's what he's doing. He is glorifying us. He's molding us and making us more like the Lord Jesus Christ, that we can see his beauty, we can love him, we can cherish him, we can honor him. Till we ultimately can have that glorification. Now, think about it. Because if you had to explain what it means to be glorified, you'd probably explain it in two different ways. And really, if we explain it with a third way, and third way is really the main way, uh, we would get the whole thing. You know, and one of the ways that we explain glorification is the whole idea, again, that there's going to be a change in our whole makeup. Isn't it true? It's going to be a whole change, again, in our physicality. You know, again, in that glorified human state, there's nothing. We're never going to use these words, COVID-19. <laughs> We're never going to use the words pandemic ever again. You know, my, my wife and I, uh, I think it was three weeks ago, uh, I think we were the first ones at the optometrist to get new glasses. You know, and my wife really needed new glasses because hers were broken on the side, and when she went down that, the glasses came off. Uh, mine were so scratched in the bifocal, when I looked down, I sort of had to tilt my head so I could see again a little straighter. You know, but there's, no, there's going to be no such thing as eyeglasses. You know, there's not going to be any, uh, any idea again of hospitals or diabetes or, um, or uh, cancer. There's going to be none of that. And many times, again, when we think of this glorification, we, we think of that perfect state as far as our physical makeup, that we're going to be given a body that's imperishable, that's uncorruptible, that's eternal in nature. You know, and we really can't understand it except speaking of the negations, can we? Well, well, we won't have this, 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 because we can't fully can grasp it because it's just not part of our experience. You know, but none of the things that are harmful, again, to us in our physicality will be part, again, of the ultimate glorification when we are changed perfectly in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's one way. The second way, again, happens to be, again, our moral makeup. 
you know, what makes sin so enticing? What makes sin so enticing is that we're sinners. You know, the reason why we sin is why? Because we want to. You know, there's some promise that we believe. If we didn't believe that promise, we wouldn't do it. And when you look at the world that happens to be around us, I'm a, I think this pandemic has put so much pressure that all these fissures that happen to be in society have just opened up and they've just burst forth. You know, we see, again, so much racism that happens to be in the, in the, in the world. We see the anti-racism movement with all of its violence that's going on today. You know, we see people shouting and red in face and not listening to one another. We see, again, uh, uh, the idea, again, of getting rid of the police in total anarchy. And we see, again, so much hatred. You know, on every side. It's just, just not one side, but it's every side. You know, imagine, again, a world. Imagine a humanity without any hatred, without any bigotry, without any broken relationships. I mean, when we look at a world that happens to be around us, that is part of our existence. We understand what it's like to live in that because that's where we live. But there's going to be an ultimate taking away of sin in my life. And think of it, it'll be taken away so much for, for my life. And we many times say this, that we will not be able to sin. But you know why we will, we will not be able to sin? Do you know why? It's because I don't want to sin. I don't have a desire for it. You know, and so we look at this, and many times when we describe this glorification, we describe again this perfect physical humanity that our whole bodies and everything will be changed. Our whole natures, our inside, again, will be changed. But we forget the whole goal of that. That's the third thing. The whole goal of that is not just that I might have, again, a sweet, sweet physicality and nature that I might be able to enjoy myself, right? Um, we used to sing that, um, uh, that hymn, you know, that one day again we'll have that mansion in a sweet by and by. You know, and, and I hate hymns like that. And why? Because it pictures uh, me in heaven, you know, on a hill somewhere <laughs> all by myself. <laughs> you know, on this wonderful mansion with this pool, you know, just, just living the life again of uh, Riley, whatever that means. And, 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 you know, once in a while I'll come down to the kingdom and I'll get my groceries and I'll go back up to the mountain. Right? That's not what it is. You know, why does God give us a perfect physicality? Why does he give us a perfect nature? And this is why. That we would see who Jesus Christ is and recognize how glorious and grand he is and worship and enjoy and praise and laud him for all of eternity. I mean, that's why he's given us that. that. So think of it. Because he, here he is, right? Right, 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 right. Eternity past. Right? Here he is. He foreknew us, forechose us. He predestined us. He called us. He justified us. And now he is glorifying us, which will end in eternity. But that process of beautification is going on now. That's what God's doing in the here and now. What's he doing? He's beginning that inward process of changing me of glorifying me, of making me more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And we say this all the time, but we never think of these words. God will send us through things that we would never choose to go through in our life. Why? To bring change that will never come in our life unless he brings us through that. Why? Because the end's glorification and the ultimate worship, the ultimate enjoyment of the Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest goal. You know, I think outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who had the toughest life ever was the Apostle Paul. You know, in some of the most encouraging words that he speaks are is in 2 Corinthians. It's all about his apostleship and the defense of his apostleship in the midst of suffering. You know, and he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse number 16, he says these words. And listen to these words. Listen to these words. He says, so, you know, speaking of struggle, speaking of suffering, speaking of agony, speaking of disappointment, speaking of all those things, and he says this, so we do not lose heart. That's what we do so often in this life, right? We look at all of the things and all of the trials and all of the sufferings, and we lose heart. We say, why am I going through this? Is it really worth it? And Paul says, no, 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 no. I understand 
the origin to destiny plan of God. And because I understand that, what I'm going through, we do not lose heart. Incredible, isn't it? And, and he explains that whole process. Listen, listen to what he says. Though our outer nature, in other words, this body, this carcass, oh, though our outer nature is wasting away, this is what's happening. Our inner nature is being renewed every day for this light, momentary affliction is preparing. What's it preparing us for? For an eternal weight of glory, a uh, uh, weight of glory beyond all comparison. There's no comparison to what God is preparing for us, but he's taking us through that process. I love what John Piper writes about this. He says, Paul clearly says that glorification has begun within us as we give attention to Christ. And he says the biblical ma maxim, listen to what the biblical maxim, in other words, this is the biblical truth. This is the biblical truth. And he tells us what it's not, first of all. He says the biblical gold maxim is not, is not, this is what we think many times, this is why we struggle, this is why we lose heart, is not seeing is believing. Isn't it true? I see it, I believe it. He says, no, 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 that's not the biblical ma maxim. But as I look into the word of God, something else happens. This is what he says. The biblical maxim is not seeing is believing, but seeing is becoming. Behold Christ. Seeing is becoming. Look to Christ with a steady gaze, and you'll become him from one degree of glory to another. Your inner nature will be renewed every day. That's the process. All of the adversities of life will be preparing for you an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. That's the consummation. Right? That's the process. That's the consummation. That's where God is taking us. And it's incredible, isn't it? You know, here it is. We're so fo focused in. No, no, it stretches back, back, way back to way there. That's what God is doing. Now think about it. Because I really do believe, especially over the last four or five months, that we're in for tough days. I mean, it's incredible, again, all the hatred that happens to be in our world, and it'll boil over, and it will find believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. It really will. And I really think we're in for tough days. You know, and in the midst of that, and it might be even in the midst of all the trials, all of the heartache, all of the sufferings that you're going through right now, somebody's going to ask you this question. Well, do you really think God is for you? Do you really think God loves you? I mean, look at your life. Look at the things that you're going through. Look at the suffering. Look at the disappointment. Look at the brokenness. How could you say God is for you? It's almost like Job's friends, isn't it? How could you say God's for you? And you say, no, 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 no. That's not the plan of God. My plan, God's plan, stretches from eternity past where he chose to love me. And he predestined me to, me to to this great end, to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, he called me to himself. And he gave me this perfect standing, again, of justification. And ultimately, through all of this, he's in that process of, process of glorification, that process of making me more like the Lord Jesus Christ, that I will not prize this world, but prize him who is ultimate, which happens to be in Jesus Christ. That's the process. We can be so myopic and forget in these turbulent times origin to destiny plan of God that he has for each one of our lives that we may ultimately praise and glorify him. Let's bow our hearts in a moment of prayer. Oh, Father, as we think of this passage of scripture, as we go through these, Lord, unbreakable links in this chain of salvation. Lord, we recognize why they're unbreakable because you are the one, Lord, who has foreknown, predestined, called, justified, and will ultimately, Lord, bring us through to that full glorification, the full reality of it. But God, as we live in the here and now, Lord, it's so hard to see how all things many times work together for good. But Lord, as we look through this origin to destiny plan, we know that we're in the greatest hands, the best hands, the most loving hands that we could ever be in. And Lord, that your plan is best. God, help us to trust. 
Help us to magnify. Help us to walk before these great truths. We thank you once again. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. I'm going to ask.